This is part one of the bioequipment talk for the Canadian Orthopedic Association basic science course. In this presentation will go through the general equipment materials used by orthopedic surgeons. There are six topics that we'll try to cover. You may have covered some of this material in your principles of surgery lectures, but we felt it was important that all orthopedic surgeons have a basic understanding of some of the bioequipment that they will employ. So what types of skin closure materials exist? First, it's important to understand why skin closure materials are used. As you know, there is primary and secondary intention healing of a wound. Skin closure materials help with primary intention healing during the first week until the proliferative phase of healing has gained momentum. After three to five days, there is about 5% tissue strength. This is due to fibroblasts depositing collagen and this provides enough tensile strength to maintain the edges of the wound together. Of course, different locations have different shear forces and blood flow, so that's why you can remove sutures from the face within five days compared to the lower limbs which take longer. After one month, the wound has approximately 50% of its regular strength. There are four groups of skin closure materials, adhesives, sutures, staples, and negative pressure wound devices. So what's the difference between liquid and tape adhesives? Liquid adhesives have been around since the 1950s, but originally they caused an excessive amount of skin reaction and dermatitis. Current liquid adhesives polymerize and harden in a non-oxygen dependent manner, so fanning them does nothing except cool them down and possibly slow down the process. They are equivalent to a 7O monocryl suture closure and should only be used in wound edges that stay together without tension. Although they theoretically provide a barrier for microbial entry, their infection rates are equivalent to suture closure. Remember, if you need to remove them, use petroleum jelly, otherwise you can peel off the skin if trying to remove them within the first two days. This is a common problem among elderly friable skin. Their main advantages are that they allow for immediate showering and don't need removal. However, their strength only lasts approximately five days, and you need to know that they are contraindicated among elderly, friable skin, in moist areas, and any wound at risk for infections like bites or diabetics. Tape adhesives are similar in that they allow for maintenance of low tissue wound edges but should have at least two centimeters of grip on either side of the wound. Their infection rates and cosmetic outcomes are similar to monocryl suture closure. However, they are contraindicated in wounds and any wound that is at risk of swelling like joints, infections, or moist areas. They have no strength after five days. And similarly, be careful when removing them. Also, the application of benzoin tincture can sometimes cause and irritation and dermatitis. Removal of skin steri strips should be done in a specific manner. Basically, always remove the suture strips from the edges towards the wound center, lifting one side and then the other. As you can see here in this picture, this physician is removing a steri strip in an incorrect fashion. There are five questions you should ask yourself when selecting a suture. First, it's important to understand how we classify sutures, which is usually done by their source or biocompatibility. Their source can be natural, synthetic, or metallic, but this often does not correspond to their biocompatibility, which is much more important, meaning that sutures can either be absorbable or non-absorbable after which there are multiple properties which are also important to consider. The five most important factors that you should consider are the coating, the absorption, the type of needle, the strength, and the stranding. Note that size is not as important as strength. The coating can significantly affect the properties of a suture. For example, it can delay its degradation as in chromium salter dyes which can double a suture's longevity. Coatings can also be bacteriostatic, 
and prevent bacterial growth, as in Vicro Plus that contains triclosan coating. And finally, it can help with tissue handling, where certain coatings allow for smooth, reduced friction, like calcium stearate on Vicryl or wax on silk sutures. All sutures undergo a tissue reaction and some degree of degradation. The images on the left show encapsulation in the upper image and hydrolysis in the bottom image. But even proline suture, which is not absorbable, has undergone some degradation after 11 years due to micro tear propagation, as you can see here in this image. The US Pharmacopeia considers a suture non absorbable if the majority of degradation occurs after the first 60 days. So for silk, this is considered a non-absorbable suture. However, silk loses most of its strength at approximately one year and is completely degraded and absent from a tissue within two years. Remember that all sutures cause a tissue reaction, even non-absorbable suture. The difference is in the subsequent reaction, which can be encapsulation, hydrolysis or proteolysis. This reaction is not only dependent on the suture but also the tissue around the suture. For example, cat gut is completely absorbed in the gut mucosa within seven days but when placed on the skin can take up to 30 days to absorb. In terms of tissue reaction, silk sutures undergo proteolysis with lots of tissue reaction. Synthetics undergo hydrolysis and non-absorbable sutures undergo encapsulation. Note that when selecting a suture, your decision will be based on the tissue healing time that you are repairing. So fast healing tissue, like the intestine, you can use an absorbable suture, while slow healing tissues like tendons or muscles require non-absorbable sutures. Also note the tissue strength of the suture within the chart. Contrary to popular belief among surgeons, PDS is thought to be stronger than monocryl. However, when comparing the same suture size, it's clearly evident that monocryl is much stronger than PDS, but its strength does not last as long due to its fast degradation. For this reason, it's important to take several factors into consideration when selecting a suture. In fact, suture strength is not only dependent on the suture itself, but also the type of knot being used. As you can see here from this graph, all the sutures are size 2. However, their strength differ considerably depending on the type of knot being applied to them. This is most evident as in the use of fiber wire, where there is significant difference in the type of knot and its strength. In terms of the type of needle being selected, the length and circle are important factors when dealing with small or large wounds. However, a much more important consideration is the needle tip. There are two tips, either rounded or cutting. Rounded tips are commonly known as tapered needles. They do not cut tissue. They simply dilate the tissue and are used for soft tissues like bowel, blood vessels, or muscle. Cutting needles are used for tough tissue, like skin or tendons. There are two types, conventional and reverse cutting. So what's the difference between the two? Well, simply put, as a modern day orthopedic surgeon, you will virtually never use a conventional needle. The reason is because the sharp edge is on the inner side of a conventional needle, as you can see here in this image. As a result, when the suture is pulled through, it tears through the tissue. On the other hand, with a reverse cutting needle, the flat surface is on the inner side. Therefore, it is unlikely to cut through the tissue when passing through it under tension. So here's an example of a suture packaging. Would you be able to understand what you're selecting? On the left side, most of the properties are self-explanatory color, size, material, and length. But on the left, you should know what type of needle you're looking for. The product and needle code is not important, but the shape, length, tip, point, and circle 
are important. So in working in small compartments, you probably want a needle with a short length and less than a half a circle to be able to make those tight corners. On the other hand, for larger sized tissues that require bigger bites, you want a longer length. The last consideration is stranding. Monofilaments are less traumatic and less likely to harbor bacteria because of their surfaces which are smooth. On the other hand, multifilaments are braided sutures. They have better strength and less susceptibility to breakage with small nicks or crimping. However, braided sutures are more likely to harbor bacteria. Note that I never mentioned that suture size is an important consideration because size has little relation to the actual strength of a suture. As a general rule, you can remember that a size 4 suture is like a tennis string, while a size 4O suture is the size of a strand of hair. These sizes are based on the US Pharmacopoeia and the American Gauge System. For those of you who are not convinced that the suture type is more important than the size, you can refer to yourself to the multiple charts and graphs available online for suture studies. So for example, a size 2O vico suture has the same strength as a size O at the bond suture, but a size 4O vico suture as well as an at the bond or proline size 4O all have similar strengths. Likewise, a size 2 fiber wire is equivalent to a size 5 at the bond suture. So why does train tracking occur if you are using a non-absorbable suture with minimal tissue reaction? There are two reasons. The first and main reason is epithelialization, where the sutures that are left in place develop a skin sinus tract around them. The second is due to gap margins. So even when you have a tight and close approximation of the skin edge superficially, the underlying tissue fills with granulation tissue and is slowly brought up towards the surface over time. In terms of these surgical guidelines, here are some general tips for suture selection. First of all, when dealing with infections, try to use a non-absorbable monofilament to minimize harboring of any bacteria. In wounds with radiotherapy or reduced healing, for example diabetics, try to use a non-absorbable suture that can stain for a longer period of time. For vessel ligation, try to use a suture that has lots of tissue reaction that can cause fibrosis and scarring, for example silk. With vessel repair, try to use a non-absorbable monofilament. For dural tears, similarly use a non-absorbable monofilament. For tendon repair, you can use a non-absorbable suture or an absorbable suture if you feel that the healing time will be less than 60 days. General tips for needle selection. If in doubt, always choose a taper point needle or a rounded needle. Otherwise, if you're dealing with skin or tendon, it's preferable to use a reverse cutting needle, whereas if you're dealing with vessels, dura, ligaments, or hand and foot tendons, try to use a taper pointed needle. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of staples? Staples close at the tips first to promote skin eversion. Otherwise, if skin inversion results, this can increase scarring and wound complications. Their advantage is that they allow five times faster skin closure and are useful in difficult areas to suture, like hairy areas. They also have similar cosmetic and infection outcomes at the six-month mark. Note that they are contraindicated around the face, feet, and hands as a sole closure material. And this is likely due to their 
risk of the staple itself injuring superficial structures around those areas. There are four types of staples. Stainless steel is the standard, but it is neither MRI nor CT compatible. Tantalum is only MRI compatible, but it is the strongest staple material. However, it causes a significant starburst effect on CT, and because it's very expensive, it is rarely used as a closure material. Titanium is the weakest of the staples, but it is both MRI and CT compatible. Finally, absorbable staples like titanium are both MRI and CT compatible, but their pricing limits their current use. The final skin closure materials we'll discuss are negative pressure wound therapy devices. These are also known as VACs or vacuum assisted closure devices. VACs not only provide a negative pressure environment to absorb edema and dead tissue, but also increased perfusion to the more superficial areas of a wound. As a result of this increased superficial perfusion, it promotes greater granulation tissue and reduces bacterial counts while stimulating wound healing. Studies show that the skin perfusion is significantly increased when these devices are active compared to their baseline. In this diagram, you can see that when the negative pressure wound therapy device is off, there is only about 35 millimeters mercury normal baseline pressure. However, when the wound vac therapy device is turned on, you can see that the amount of perfusion units are significantly increased. In terms of their settings, there are some conflicting recommendations, but in general, a pressure suction pressure of minus 125 millimeters of mercury is the optimum setting with the exception of patients with peripheral vascular disease, elderly, excessive bleeding or pain, where these patients should have a reduced pressure of minus 75 millimeters mercury. In terms of continuous versus intermittent settings, there is some evidence that an intermittent setting results in greater granulation tissue formation. This is likely related to the periods of hypoxia, which promotes greater gran Relation, angiogenesis, and cellular matrix support to the tissue cells, allowing them to survive. However, the recommendation is still to maintain the vac on continuous suction for the first 48 hours to remove debris and edema before switching over to an intermittent setting. Typically, a 3-5 to five minute on and a 2 minute off setting is employed. Try to avoid placing the sponge on healthy skin, and remember that VAC devices are contraindicated around blood vessels, infections, patients with coagulopathies, and cancers. Also note that there are other techniques and methods with similar results and significantly reduced costs, including Papineau techniques, skin flaps or grafts, and other cheaper alternatives. In terms of the sponges, the, spore, the pore size determines their use. The black sponge has a larger pore size of approximately 500 microns. Therefore, they absorb moisture. They are contraindicated over tendons and bone. On the other hand, the white sponge has a much smaller pore size of only approximately 150 microns. And therefore, this allows more moisture retention while still creating a negative pressure environment. As a result, there is less granulation tissue formation with the white sponge, but it can be used over tendons, bone, and hardware implants. Thank you. This completes part one of the bioequipment talk.